We're going to begin. Good evening. We're going to begin. Parshas, this week is Parshas Vayigash. We're going to discuss the story of Joseph revealing himself to his brothers. So just to recap the story of Yosef. Yosef was sold into slavery by his brothers. Ten of his brothers sold him into slavery. They didn't like him. They were jealous of him, etc., etc. He sold him into to become a slave. He ends up being thrown into prison. But last week you read how the Pharaoh had a dream and Joseph was the one who interprets the dream for the Pharaoh. And he ends up becoming the viceroy, the second in command, the one who controls the entire Egypt, makes all the decisions in Egypt under the direct guidance of the Pharaoh. Beautiful. There's a famine in the land. Yosef's family living in Canaan need food. So it's their father, Yaakov, sends them down to Egypt. They come down and Yosef has this whole thing. He, they regret terribly. They start telling him, oh, we lost that one brother. He ends up making this plot to put their money and back into their bags. And he takes the his silver goblet and puts it in the bag of Binyamin. Chases after them and says, you stole my goblet. They say no. He says, well, search. They search. They find it in Binyamin's bag. And they come back to Joseph saying, we'll all become slaves. And Joseph says, no, what's his business? The youngest one, Binyamin, will stay a slave. Everyone else go back. And Yehuda approaches. Vigash Elav Yehuda. Yehuda approaches y Yosef and begs and pleads and says, you don't understand this. Our souls are connected. His soul is connected with Yaakov. If he doesn't come back, my father's going to die. This is going to be too painful, too traumatic for him. This is going to be a disaster. And now we have, hold on one second. Yosef could not control his, his emotions. He saw how much his brothers regretted selling him and how terribly they felt. So he reveals himself to his brothers and says, I am Yosef. I'm going to pick up on that today in the class. If you open up in your Chumash, you have the Chumash in front of you, you can open up to chapter 45, verse 4. And Yosef tells his brothers, come close to me, and they approach Yosef. And he says, I am Joseph, who you sold in Egypt. Then he tells him, here's the most, what does Yosef tell his brothers? The first thing after he reveals to them who he is, what does he say? The Akta, and now, Al He tells them, don't be sad. And let it not trouble you. That you sold me here. For it was to preserve life that God sent me before you. So the first thing Yosef tells them is, don't be mad, don't be angry, don't be sad, don't be remorseful that you sold me here. Why? Because God sent me here in order that I should preserve life. Fast forward a little bit. He says, go back home and bring dad, bring our father Yaakov back down to Mitzrayim. What does he send to his father? He sends to him 10 donkeys. That's what he sends him. He sends him 10 donkeys. In verse number 23, chapter 45, verse 23, Ulo Oviv Sholach Kizoy sent his father. He sent these Asara Chavoidim, 10 male donkeys, Noisim Dil Mitzrayim, carrying gifts from the best of Egypt. And 10 female donkeys carrying grain, bread, and other food for his father for the way. What's the business of 10 donkeys? 11 donkeys, 9 donkeys, maybe send 11, one for each brother. What's the business with 10 donkeys? That's what he sends his father, 10 donkeys. Why did he send his father 10 donkeys? So that's one question. Well, let's get to the root of the discussion we're going to have tonight. And that is forgiveness, too much forgiveness. forgiveness. We know we know that Shulchan Aruch says that when someone asks you for forgiveness, you, should, you shouldn't be stingy with forgiving. You should forgive them. But if you know that they're going to do it again and again and again, you can't eat. Don't forgive them. Why? Because they're all eating, they can do it again. It turns the whole thing into a joke. You're making the whole thing into a joke. He punches you in the face, says, I'm sorry, you forgive me. Yes. Here you go. Here's another punch. I'm sorry, you forgive me. Yes. Here's another punch. Eventually, you are you're ruining the entire process of forgiveness. The whole, the whole concept, the emotion, the feeling behind it, there's no remorse. There's no feeling of regret. Turn into a joke. So that's not real requesting for forgiveness. So let's let's understand like this. Yosef's brothers sell him to Egypt. They sell him to, to, to be a slave. And he ends up becoming who Joseph, the great Joseph, leader of Egypt. 
And now what's the first thing he tells his brothers? I am Joseph. And now what? Don't be sad. Why shouldn't they be sad? Isn't that part of the process of forgiveness? You have to feel sad and remorseful. And then we can forgive you. Why is he telling them not to be sad? So maybe you're going to say, maybe one would suggest, read what the verse says. Why shouldn't they be sad? Because Joseph was saying, because God sent me. In other words, God orchestrated everything. It was all by God. You guys did nothing. You had nothing to do with this whole process. God was the one that did everything. If that's the case, what is he telling them? He's telling them that your behavior are meaningless. Because God runs the world. God controls everything. So you have no say in what happens. You have no control in what happens. But we read clearly in the Rambam, in Mishnah Torah, the laws of repentance, chapter 5, law number 2. The Rambam says very clearly over there, give no room in your mind to that which is asserted by the fools of the nations and also by most Jewish ignoramuses. They say that God decrees that a man from his birth should be either a righteous man or a wicked man. This is not the case. On the contrary, every man is fit to be as righteous as Moses or as wicked as Yeroboam, a wise man or a fool, charitable or cruel, a miser or giving, and so too all other moral dispositions. Moreover, no one compels, no one determines or forcibly draws him to either of the two ways. But it is man himself in his own mind who turns to whichever way he desires. In other words, this is the foundation of free choice. You are given freedom to choose how to behave. God gives you freedom to choose. You want to be charitable? You want to be a miser? You want to do good? You want to be evil? You want to say something nice? You want to say something nasty? That's up to you. God gives you that ability to choose and make that decision. This is what the prophet Jeremiah said. Good and evil do not come out from the mouth of God. Meaning, the creator does not, declare, does not decree that a man should be either good or wicked. Therefore, the sinner himself is the cause for his own ruin. It is thus fitting for him to weep and lament over his sin and to grieve for having done this to his own soul and dealing with it so wickedly. So we see clearly that Ammon says a principle of Judaism is God gives you the freedom to choose. And if you make poor decisions, if you do something wrong, you do something evil, what must you do? Grieve for having done this to his own soul. And it's fitting to weep and lament over his sin. So why is Joseph stripping his brothers of the ability to do proper repentance? He's telling them, don't be remorseful. Don't be sad. Because God did it. That can't be what he was telling them. It can't be he was telling them that God runs the whole world and you had no choice in the matter. You had no freedom to choose to sell me. That goes against everything that Judaism stands for. So good behavior is completely in our, in our own hands. And therefore, because good behavior is in our hands, if we misbehave, we have to weep and lament. His brothers misbehaved. They had to weep and lament. Why is he telling them not to? Additionally, what's the first word that he tells them? He says, and now don't be sad. What's this word, and now? Begins Beginning this, this conversation with them by saying, I am Joseph. And now don't be sad. What do you mean, and now. I am Joseph, don't be sad. What, what does it mean, and now? And similarly, what did he say? God sent me here. What was he trying to stress with the words that God sent me here? Okay. So in order to understand this, we have to get to understanding Anger, and what does Judaism have to say about anger? Anger management, what do we have to say about this emotion of anger? So the emotion of anger is discussed throughout the Torah in many, many stories. It's discussed in Jewish law and in Jewish ethical teachings. And it's explained over there how anger is a negative character trait that must be managed and, if, and controlled. Anger is so terrible. Anger is so terrible that Maimonides says that even when it's appropriate to be angry, like in certain situations when you educate a child, 
even then it's best to be avoided as well. That's how distant one should remain from anger. Mishnah Torah and the laws of Deus, chapter two. Halak Mishnah, halak, I'm sorry, Halacha three. Akas midaroi adnuma oid. Anger is a very evil trait, and it's appropriate to distance oneself from it to the opposite extreme, and to train oneself not to be irritated at all, not even by a thing, and not even by a thing is calculated to provoke anger. If at times it's necessary to impress fear upon one's children, one's household, or even the whole general congregation, he happens to be the leader and wishes to show anger to them so that they mend their conduct, he should act as if he were angry in front of them when rebuking them, but should nevertheless remain composed within himself, just as one might feign anger when provoked. And here's the, here's the strong words of the Ram. Our sages say, it's a quote, if one becomes angry, it's as if one serves idols. Yes. It's as if one serves idols. They also said, he who does not curb his anger, if he's a wise man, his wisdom departs from him. If he's a prophet, his prophecy departs from him. And the life of an angry man can be scarcely be called life. The sages have therefore directed that a man should distance himself from anger and train himself so as not to take notice even of provocations. This is unbelievable. So what do you think? The Ramadan is doing scare tactics? If you become angry, if you get angry at someone, it's as if you served idols. Idols, Idol worship is a cardinal sin. Cardinal sin. You're worshiping idols. You try to get a, 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 a clickbait over here. Try to say something extreme that, that, that's not true. That's what the rabbis were doing. What were the rabbis thinking when they said it's as if you serve idols? How is getting angry equivalent to serving idols? But before we get to that, let's deal with anger management for a moment. If you find yourself becoming angry, what should you do? Count to ten. What does one do? What does one do when provoked in anger? So in Mishle, in the book of Proverbs, chapter 15, verse number one, the verse says like this: a gentle response calms down anger. And a harsh word provokes wrath. Which means simply as simple as can be. If you are angry, if you become angry, someone does something, someone provokes you. Or you see someone else who's angry. How do you handle the situation? Speak calmly to them. Speak calmly to them. Furthermore, if you yourself are becoming angry, start speaking calmly to yourself. Speak calmly to yourself. It's unbelievable. And you'll see how it's going to work magic. A soft response calms down anger. Don't yell. If it's at someone else, you someone else is screaming at you, don't scream back at him. What's going to happen if you scream back at him? You'll provoke them to continue the screaming. You'll provoke the anger even more. But if you speak calmly, automatically that's going to calm them down a notch as well. If you find yourself getting angry, speak words calmly to yourself. And you'll find that you'll be lowering your own temperature by this exercise. So words have tremendous power and impact on our feelings. And calm words can break down our very own anger, along with other negative qualities. So that's when it comes to anger management. The tip for anger management, speak calm. Not a tip for me. A tip that goes back thousands of years, quoted in the book of Mishnah, the book of Proverbs. Chapter 15, verse number one. But let's get now a little deep. Because if you get angry, you'll speak calmly and you'll calm yourself down. But all you've done was you've dealt with the situation at hand right now. But you did not deal with the root cause. What's going to stop me from getting angry tomorrow? If I speak calmly now, it doesn't prevent anger tomorrow. Because I didn't address the root cause of anger. I've only 
dealt with it after the fact. But how does one prevent anger to begin with? For this, we have to understand what does it mean? Anger is like idol worship. The central cardinal sin of idol worship is compared to anger. How so? So the Atarev explains in Tanya Gersa Kodesh 25. He says like this, The wise can readily understand the reason why this is so. For at the time when you are angry, faith has left you. It's not possible to become angry if you are rooted in your faith. Because if you did believe that it's from God that this has happened to you, they would never get angry at all. Why do I get angry? Because I think I'm in control. And when this happens to me, terrible, disaster. I'm driving to a meeting and God's with you have a flat tire. Become angry. I'm mad. How could this be? Where's your belief in God? If you believed in God, if you would feel that belief that you have in those moments, it would be impossible for you to become angry. What are you getting angry at? God controls the world. God caused you to have a flat tire now. Belief. God's in control. Why do I get angry? Because I forget that God's in control. I think that I'm in control. I will be the one to determine my own destiny. I'm the one that has full power over the way this is going to go down. That's why I get angry when it doesn't work out the way that I want it to, and the way I anticipated. Work on your faith. Work on your trust in Hashem. If you have trust and faith in Hashem, you don't get angry. You don't get angry. But that's all when it comes to things that happen to me by forces other than human. What about when fellow human beings do something to me? When another man or woman harms me, causes me, provoking me into anger? What do I say then? How does this work now? Let's back up for a second. How does this work over here? We just said in the beginning of the lesson that every single person has freedom to choose to do good or bad. So if this person is choosing to anger me, why is it a lack of faith to get angry at them for that? <coughs> Following? Why is that a lack of faith? We said before that they have the freedom to choose to do it. So if they're choosing to do bad, it means I could get angry at them because you're doing it. It's not God. This is you. You chose to hit me. You chose to curse me. Most certainly deserve anger in return. You ruined my plans. So if it's something that doesn't have free choice, like a tire on a car, so then you're right. There's no place for anger. But if it's another human being who does, is there a place for anger or not? See how the Rebbe explains that in that situation of another human being, there's also no room for anger. Why not? Why should I not get angry when somebody else ruins my plans, when somebody else curses me, when somebody else strikes me, when someone else causes me harm or pain or suffering? Why should I not get angry at them? Says the Atarebbe, after Ben Adam, after Ben Adam, even though it's true, if somebody harms you, somebody causes you pain, if someone strikes you, they're going to have to be, you could sue them in court, take them to court, etc., etc., etc. Either God will punish them or the courts will meet up punishment for them. That's all true. But you should know one thing. God already ordained that this is going to happen to you. You have to be, I have to be the recipient of this and this happening. 
The question is only one thing. Who's going to do it? That it is going to get done is for certain. That God already determined. The question is only who is going to do it. And for that, God has many, many agents. Anybody and everyone is an agent of God's to fulfill this mission. To cause me harm. The question is, do you want to sign up for this mission to cause me harm? Or not? It's going to happen to me. But if you sign up to do it, you'll be punished accordingly. Everyone should say, not me. When it comes to causing someone else harm, not me. This is not my business. So we have over here, there's two layers over here. There's the layer, there's the level, there's the perspective of the one who is causing damage, the one who's causing harm. And then there is the recipient of that damage or harm. There's the one who is provoking and there is the one who's being provoked. The one who is provoking, the one who's causing damage and harm, God is going to deal with them accordingly. The courts will deal with them accordingly. The recipient, don't think for one moment that that person is the reason why you're caused harm. That person is the reason why you were damaged. That person is the reason why you are provoked. Not at all. It's God. It could have been anyone. It would have been someone else. What does it make a difference to you? It doesn't make a difference to you, really. You're just using that person as the guinea pig to get angry. But again, why are you getting angry? Due to a lack of faith. Because you don't believe that God is the one that's controlling everything. God is the one who's controlling everything. God is the one who's ordaining that every single thing in my life, what should and shouldn't happen to me. That's the hashkocha, that's the amuna. A lack of this faith, it's like I'm serving the idols. I'm recognizing there's another power in this world besides for God. Something happens in this world that's not directly ordained by God. That's equivalent to idol worship. Nevertheless, it is his simultaneously true. It's simultaneously true that heaven has already decreed that this person will be damaged and heaven has many messengers to deliver this punishment. Even more, at the very moment that one is being damaged or cursed, the power of God is invested in the damager, giving him life and sustaining him. God is the one that's enabling him. No one can cause anyone else harm without being enabled by God to do so. Stop getting angry at the messenger. The messenger is a nobody. They'll be dealt with by God for their choosing to sign up to this negative behavior. But don't think for a moment that they're the ones that determines who gets hurt and who doesn't get hurt in this world. So you're driving and someone cuts you off. You're going, to get angry. you're going to get angry at them. They could have not cut you off. True. But you know something? They could have not cut you off. But it could not have happened that you wouldn't be cut off. If it wasn't them, it would have been somebody else. Don't get angry. This is the way God wants it to be. Easier said than done. But this is dealing with the root core essence of our anger. Anger comes from a lack of emuna, a lack of trust in Hashem, a lack of faith in Almighty God. When someone has a robust faith, they don't get angry. They know that everything in this world comes from Hashem. And we see this by David Amel, King David. King, David. King David has a son named Avshalom. What did Avshalom do to David Amelech? You know what Avshalom did? Avshalom was David Amelech's son, and he challenged David Amelech's rulership. He revolted against his own father. He wanted to kill his own father. David Amelech was chased out of Jerusalem by his son 
and his son's arm. You can imagine the feeling that David Melech had running for to save his life from his own son. And yet, David Melech, while he was fleeing during this rebellion, he passed a certain Jew named Shimi ben Gera. And Shimi ben Gera cursed him. Said nasty things to David Melech. Who was at that time still the Melech Yisrael, the king of the Jewish people. He cursed the Jew. He cursed the king of the Jewish people. And David Melech didn't become angry at him. They wanted his men wanted to take Shimi and kill him. And he said, No, 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 no. Don't do anything to Shimi. You know why you shouldn't do anything to Shimi? God wanted me to be cursed. I needed to hear that. That's what God wanted me to hear right now. Shimi was nobody. Shimi was only, God said, curse him. And Shimi signed up for that and said, okay, I'll be the one to do it. It would have been Shimi, it would have been somebody else. So therefore, don't take retribution on Shimi ben Gera. We find this many times in other situations as well. There was a, fa a famous chassid of the Rebbe, of the previous Rebbe, and the Rebbe's name was Ramen Lofutifas. He passed in the 90s. Men of Futovas lived his life in self-sacrifice in Russia to help Jews escape the former Soviet Union. He himself was caught and was put in the gulags. And many times he was desperate and they threatened him they were going to kill him. And he told them like this. He said, if God wants me to be alive, if God wants me to be alive, so then all of you interrogators and all you policemen are unable to harm me. And if God wants me to die, he said, the moment I walk out of here, I could be hit by a truck too. I'm not afraid. You're not going to threaten me. I'm not afraid of anything because his faith was robust. He was unflinching in his faith in Almighty God. So if you want to truly uproot anger, if you want to get rid of anger, the way to do that is you have to strengthen your faith. Anyone who harms me is just merely a messenger, a messenger of God. They shouldn't have done it. Now let's get back to the story of Joseph. Excuse me. Let's get back to the story of Joseph for a second. Yosef begins speaking to his brothers by saying the words, Ve'ata, and now. And now. And now what? Now that what happened? Since I'm Joseph, you shouldn't be sad? That's what he means when he says, and now? But now we can understand what Yosef was saying. Yosef was telling his brothers as follows. Now that you have demonstrated your regret now that you've already shown remorse for throwing me into the pit, you can stop worrying because your actions were ultimately good. The only real issue here was the negative intentions, not the actions alone. But now that you have shown your regret for your negative intentions, all that remains are the inherently positive actions. So therefore, all is good. He says, God sent me here. He said it three times, God sent me here. To explain to his brothers why he was in the position to help them. In other words, Yosef recognized something fascinating. Yosef never was upset at his brothers. Because Yosef recognized that what happened to me needed to happen to me. Why did God want this to happen to me? He merited to see why God wanted it to happen. You see, most of the time, most people don't merit to see the end game of why it's good. We get stuck in our tunnel vision and we think it's dark, it's dark, it's dark. For 22 years, Joseph was living in darkness. But after 22 years, he merited to see the light at the end of the tunnel and said, ah, now I know why my brothers got jealous of me. Now I know why they threw me into a pit. Now I know why they sold me. Now I know why I had to go into prison. Now I know why I had to meet everyone that I met in prison. 
because God wanted me to sustain the world with food because there was going to be a famine and to bring the Jewish people down to Egypt. Yosef saw that. And he saw the only way it could have happened. Every detail in the story added up now to him. So from Yosef's perspective, it was all good. But just because from Yosef's perspective, it's all good, that doesn't mean that his brothers get away scot-free. They did something wrong. I'm not angry at you, Yosef tells them, because angry at you would be a lack of faith and understanding of that Hashem runs the world. I'm not angry at you, but you still have to show me one thing. And what's that? Remorse for recognizing we had bad intentions. We didn't throw him into the pit because we wanted him to become the leader of Egypt. We throw him into the pit to hurt him. Our intentions were wrong. We provoked him for the wrong reasons. And for that, you have to show regret. But at this point in the story, the brothers have already demonstrated that regret. A number of times, Yosef sees how remorseful they are. That's why Yosef can no longer contain his emotions. Because at this point now, he realizes this is unbelievable. Now I see God's plan revealed before me. From my perspective, it's 100% good. And from their perspective, what's wrong now? They've behaved in a manner that shows they truly are remorseful. He says, Va'ata now. Don't be sad. Don't be angry at yourself. That's done. It's finished. It's behind us. No more room for that. God sent me here. I see now why God sent me here, and therefore everything now adds up. Why did Joseph send donkeys to his father? We ask. What's the significance of the donkeys that Joseph sent to his father? To the Maral of Prague explains. The donkeys were a hint to his father. They were 10 brothers at the time of the sale of Joseph, who just like 10 donkeys, bore a great load and did not know what they carried. He was trying to hint to his father, these guys were doing things they didn't even know what they were doing. They were agents of God. They were merely agents of God to fulfill a mission. That doesn't mean they had a right to do it. They have to ask for forgiveness. They have to say, I'm sorry. They have to, as he said earlier, from the words of the Ram, they have to lament over the sin that they did. And the brothers did do enough of that. So he was telling his father, my dear father, I don't hold any grudges against my brothers. They were carrying a load that they didn't even know what it was. God orchestrated that the sale should happen in order that Yosef should reach Egypt and the brothers were not aware of the heavenly plan that they themselves were carrying out. Therefore, the 10 male donkeys carrying gifts from the best of Egypt hinted at the fact that through Yosef's sale into slavery, through the 10 unaware messengers of Yosef's fate, they would eat of Egypt's best to the time that the descendants would empty out of Egypt during the Exodus, when they would completely take from Egypt all of the sparks of Almighty God. So in conclusion, to sum it all up, we learn from Yosef the need to recognize God in our lives. If we see that God runs the world and is in fact the only power, the only power in the universe, that is, if we don't worship idols as we spoke earlier, we can uproot the essential reason for our anger in our lives in which and live a life in which we see everything is ultimately for the good. Particularly, we have to stress when it comes to the actions of others. And now other people seem to hurt us with their decision-making. We learn from Yosef that they are only messengers. And it's God, our loving, merciful Father in heaven, who is ultimately concerned with our own good, who's actually running the show. Any questions? Any questions? Yossi, any questions?